How do you store large files efficiently in the cloud? An excellent solution for that is using Supabase Storage. And in today's video, I'm going to show you how you can work with Supabase Storage and the C Sharp client library to make working with files in your API incredibly simple. I also want to thank Supabase for sponsoring this video and helping me bring Supabase closer to the .NET community. Supabase Storage is one of the key offerings that Supabase has and it's an open source object store that allows you to persist any kind of file in the cloud. It also makes it easy to introduce custom access policies using row level security. There's an excellent article on the Supabase blog about the storage feature and they do a very deep dive into the architecture of the solution. I think it's going to be a wonderful read for you. So I'm going to leave the link down in the description and I'm going to cover the architecture on a high level just so you can understand how the storage works. Here's the high level architecture of Supabase storage and there's three distinct components. One is the actual storage frontend, the second is the middleware and the third component is the storage backend. On the front end, you have the dashboard, which is the Supabase user interface, but we're actually going to be using the Supabase C Sharp client to interact with Supabase storage. The middleware layer exposes an API that allows you to persist your storage buckets and files in Postgres, whereas the actual file content is stored in the backend. Your files are actually persisted on Amazon's S3, which stands for Simple Storage Service, but the backend can be switched for something else, like Backblaze, for example. For a deeper understanding of how all of this works together, I suggest that you read the article about Supabase storage that I'm going to leave in the description of this video. Supabase Launch Week 7 just wrapped up and there are some exciting features that were added to Supabase storage. The highlight is resumable uploads supporting files as large as 50 gigabytes. You can see a demo here of uploading a file that is 1000 megabytes large, pausing the upload and then continuing from where you left off. This is what the resumable upload feature enables and is going to be great when you are dealing with internet connectivity issues. Another feature that was added was more options for image transformations. Now you can also specify the quality and format filters. The quality filter will be really practical for saving on bandwidth costs in those situations where you don't need to show the high quality image. One more interesting feature that was just introduced is pre-signed upload URLs. You can generate the pre-signed upload URL in your backend and then share it with other users who can use it to upload the file to storage without further authorization. If you want to take a look at the complete list of the new storage features, I'm going to add a link to the blog post describing these features in depth in the description of the video. I'm going to use the project that I built in the Supabase crash course video and we're going to expand it to use Supabase storage. I built an API that allows us to persist newsletters in the Supabase database and we also have an endpoint to fetch the newsletter with a given ID and then delete a newsletter based on the given ID. We're going to introduce support for adding cover images to our newsletters and then we're going to persist the actual cover image in Supabase storage. Our newsletter is represented with this class. It inherits from the base model class, which is required by the Postgres library. And then we use attributes to configure the primary key and the columns. And of course, also the table where our newsletter is persisted. So if I go back to my endpoint, what we actually want to do is we want to extend this request object, which is the create newsletter request to also contain a file, which is going to represent our newsletter cover image. So if I go to the object, you'll see that we have properties matching the ones on the newsletter. And the simplest way to introduce a file is to use the iForm file interface. And then we're going to send a form data request to our API, which will contain the cover image. And then let's see how we're going to use it in our endpoint. Let's persist the cover image in Superbase storage after we have persisted the entity in the database, which is this call here. We're using the Supabase client library, telling it which table we want to persist the entity in. And then we're calling insert, which is going to call the Postgres endpoint exposed on our Supabase instance. And it's going to persist the newsletter in the database. To interact with Supabase storage, 
you need to access the client and then you have access to the storage client property. The storage client allows you to work with buckets. You can think of the Superbase storage as the file system in the cloud and buckets represent the top level folders in your storage instance. So let's say we want to create a bucket that is going to contain our cover images. So we can call it cover images. We can also pass in an instance of the bucket upsert options to set the bucket that we are creating as a public bucket. This means that any files stored inside can be accessed by anyone and there's no security present on our bucket. So if I set public to true, then this is going to become a public bucket and anyone that has a URL to our files will be able to access them. So now that we have created our bucket, we can go ahead and persist our newsletter cover image, but this is going to be inefficient to try to create the bucket every time. So what you can do is check if the bucket exists and then create it if it does not. But another solution could be to just go to the Superbase dashboard, which is what we are going to do. And you can simply create your bucket from here. You're going to have a bit more options. So I'm going to use the same name that I used earlier, which is cover images. We can decide if we want this to be a public bucket or not. Because I want to expose my newsletter cover images to the public, I'm going to make the bucket public. Of course, you're going to get a warning that you should be careful when doing this because you don't want to expose sensitive information. And if I press the additional configuration menu, you see that we have options of configuring the file upload size limit. And you can also configure the allowed MIME types that you want to support in your bucket. For example, if we only want to allow images or videos, you can do that by setting this option. I'm not going to touch these options and I'm just going to create my cover images bucket. So now that we have our bucket in place, let's go and use it in our API. I'm going to get rid of this and let's persist the cover image form file in our bucket. How you do that is by calling client storage and then you say from and you specify the ID of the bucket that you want to access. The ID is the actual name of the bucket, which is cover images. And then you have options for working with files in the bucket. The method that we are looking for is the upload method. It allows us to upload our file to the bucket. So we need to pass the byte array representing our file, the path to the file in the bucket. This is ideally some unique identifier. And then we can configure some additional options. To get the byte array of our image, I'm going to create a new memory stream instance. And then I'm going to copy the contents of our cover image into this memory stream. We're going to say request cover image. And then I can say copy to. I can also use the async version. So let's go ahead and try that one. We're going to copy into the memory stream. And I'm going to, of course, await this. And now the contents of our image are inside of the memory stream and we can pass the contents to our upload method by calling memory stream to array. And we also want to pass in the path to our file. Now I'm going to scope this based on the newsletter ID. So let's say this is cover images and then we want to add newsletter. I'm going to take the ID from the new newsletter ID value and then we need to add the extension. You need to access the last index of the dot in the file name, which represents the file extension, and then grab the actual extension by calling substring. And then we can use the file extension and pass it to our upload method. So this is going to upload the file that was sent to our API into the respective storage bucket. To actually be able to use form files in our request, like I did here, we're going to have to move our endpoint into a controller. So let's introduce a newsletters controller into our folder. I'm going to give it a name of newsletters controller. And we're going to get rid of the API route here. Let's add our endpoint that was previously in minimal APIs to the controller. We had an HTTP post endpoint and we're going to call it create newsletter. It's going to be asynchronous and it's going to return a task of I action results. So create newsletter. For the arguments, we're going to add the create newsletter request. We'll give it a name of request. And we're also going to inject the Superbase client instance like we did in our minimal API endpoint. 
So now I can go and take all of this code here and move it into our controller endpoint so that we can actually work with form files and we're just going to replace this with OK of newsletter ID. Of course, we can't have two endpoints with the same route. So I'm going to remove the minimal API endpoint. And now we're going to try out and see if our upload is working. I'm going to send our form data request to our API, which is going to contain the cover image. If I send this request, we should hit our endpoint. We're inside of the create newsletter endpoint. We create the newsletter object and we insert it into the database by calling the Postgres endpoint. You can see our newsletter is persisted in the database and it has an ID of 18. So let's go ahead and upload our file to storage. So we're going to create a memory stream. We're going to copy the cover image contents into the memory stream. We're going to grab the file extension to be able to create our file path. And we're going to upload our file using the storage API into the cover images bucket. So you can see this successfully completed and we're going to return our response from our API. We have the ID of the newsletter here. We're going to use this in just a moment. Let's head over to the Superbase dashboard to see that the file was successfully uploaded. Here's my cover images bucket and you can see that our file is indeed uploaded. If I check the file, you can see I have some SQL query and an execution plan, which may just be the subject of my future newsletter. Now let's see how to expose the file from our bucket so that our frontend can consume it. I'm going to update the newsletter response to also include the cover image URL. So I'm going to add it here as a string and this is going to be the cover image URL. We're going to add the value from the Superbase client. So I'm going to add it here in the cover image URL. We're going to grab the URL from the Superbase client and we're looking for the storage client to be able to access our cover images bucket. And once we have the bucket, we have the option of getting the public URL for a given path, which is essentially our file in the bucket, or we can create a signed URL for files that are not public. If you have files containing sensitive information or any data that should not be publicly exposed, you want to make your bucket private. And then how you can expose the file is by creating a signed URL, which you can give an expiration time during which it can be accessed. After it expires, the link is invalid and it's going to return nothing. Alternatively, you can also call the download method to fetch the raw byte array for the file by specifying the path to the file and then you can download it from your bucket and expose it further if you need to. We're going to use the get public URL method to get the public URL for our file. So I'm going to construct the public URL. So we're going to use newsletter. Then we're going to grab the ID of the newsletter and I'm going to just append PNG because I know this is the extension. Ideally, we could store this in the newsletter table so that we can access it to construct the public URL. So let's see how this is working. If I call the get endpoint for the newsletter that we just created, we're going to get back the response and it's going to include the public URL to our file. If I try to access the public URL, you'll see that we get back the image that I originally uploaded to the Superbase storage. What's interesting is that Superbase also has a transform API on top of the storage, which is currently in beta and only available on the pro plan. But what you can do with transformations is you can append values to the query string. For example, I can append a width and height property. Let's say I wanted to have a width of 50 and a height of also 50. So I want a square image. And if I request my image using this URL, this is going to apply the transformation on the actual storage instance and it's going to give me back the resized image. This is incredibly practical for front-end applications where you want to be able to serve the same image in different sizes based on the current screen that you are on. Unfortunately, this feature still isn't part of the client library, but it's going to be exposed in the get public URL method where you can pass in an instance of the transform options which currently don't exist, as I mentioned. You can use this to specify the transformations that you want to apply on the file that you are exposing from your storage bucket. Lastly, we also have a delete endpoint here, 
and it's important to clean up after ourselves. So what we're going to do is after deleting the file, we're also going to delete it from the storage instance. So we can say client and then access the storage client. And we're going to say from the cover images bucket. And we're going to then delete the file by calling the remove method. And we specify the file path, which I will copy from here. We actually need to pass in a list of strings and then we can pass our actual file. So let me move this down so you can see it is better. After we delete the file by calling the delete method on the Superbase client, we also make sure to clean up the file in the storage by calling the remove endpoint and passing the path to our file in the storage bucket. What do you think about the Superbase storage feature? I found it very easy to work with as the C Sharp client library is a simple abstraction on top of Superbase storage. If you want to grab the source code for this video, it's available on my GitHub and you can access it from the link that's going to be in the description of this video. Again, I want to say thank you to Superbase for sponsoring this video and helping me spread the word about Superbase in the .NET community. If you enjoyed this video, then make sure to smash that like button, subscribe to my channel, and until next time, stay awesome.